They're all our favorite words, right? Bounce house, hot dogs and hamburgers. Okay, so everybody should know by now, next Sunday, July 31st, we're doing our giant grown and chilling back to school event. I have the bounce houses here in the building. Like it came early, it's mm, fantastic. We have an ice cream machine, popcorn machine, hot dogs and hamburgers, cornhole, nine square, gaga ball, face painting, like all the fun stuff. You guys know the what, you've been hearing the what for like weeks now when we promote this, but I wanna share today the why. Okay, the reason we're doing this is not just because we love having fun, because like I love, I love cheeseburgers, and I, my kids love bounce houses, but the why that we're doing this is maybe the most important thing. See, we've been doing a lot of small group studies, a lot of work in our church the last maybe year and a half, priming ourselves for a big move out into the community to go and actually be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go out and do the discipleship. That is our most important goal. And what we've learned through all these studies, people who really know what they're talking about, is that discipleship starts with relationship. We, we aren't going to be able to speak into the lives. What people are looking for in this day and age is authentic relationship. They want to know that you care. They want to know this is a place they can come and belong. They can grow with us. And so this event is a, an excellent opportunity to build relationship, to show people in the community that we really do care about them. We care about their kids. We care about their lives, that we can have a very casual, very uh, undaunting kind of event where we can just get to know our neighbors because that's where discipleship starts and so we want every single one of you to be here next Sunday to help us build relationships with our community and show them that we care. Now one of the big concerns we've been hearing is where are we going to park? Uh, I brought a visual aid because both of our parking lots will be closed next Sunday because we have a bounce house and five grills and all these games and we, we need the parking lot space but have no fear our awesome team has worked together to come up with some solutions for parking. So, we bought some of these. This is my visual aid to show people around town all the lots we have secured to park in. So, right across the road at the, uh, the carpet store is one lot. We have the Sunrise Bakery has agreed to let us use their lot. The South lot at the Knight Bergman Center is open to us. The North lot is actually being used for a family reunion, so that one's not available. All the street parking. Uh, the lot across from Riverside Park is open. And because we know that's a lot of walking, we have a valet parking service going on. Uh, Mike Keene is going to valet parks for people. So all you have to do is pull up to the church and he will go park your car for you. And you can just hop out, come right on into church. We also have a shuttle service running. So we're going to have a route uh, with the church bus going around to the different outlying lots all morning long, picking people up and bringing them to the church if that is too far for you to walk. And then we will take you right back to your vehicle. So you don't have to worry about parking. Uh, we we are asking that if you're young and able-bodied uh, to park as far away as you can and either wait for a shuttle bus or walk so that our visitors and our older folks don't have to park so far away because we do want to be kind and relational in that regard. We want to leave parking close to the building for our visitors who don't know about the parking situation so they can feel like they have street parking or parking really close. Uh, so they don't come, see there's no parking, then turn around and leave. We don't want that to happen. So if you have a question about where to park, when to park, who's coming to get you, see me, Mickey, Andrew, Mike. we got a lot of people who are involved in making sure the logistics of this event work really well. So have no fear. Uh, we will have a place for you to land. Also, we really want you to be involved. So we still have opportunities where we need some volunteers to plug in and do some stuff for us. So if you have not been reached out to or if you have not uh, responded to whether or not you can help, come see one of us on the team. Uh, the Kearns, the Fishers, the Strongs, us, um, help me out here, Percival's. I'm just having a brain moment. Himes, thank you. Uh, any of those people. If you're at all interested, and even like something simple, um, stand at a bounce house with a, with a timepiece, making sure kids get out of the bounce house would be great. We would love to have you all help. So with that being said, I'd like to open our service this morning with a word of prayer. So if you all join me, Father God, thank you so much for this community that we have. Uh, thank you that our church is filled with awesome people who really do have a heart for evangelism, who want to show the community that we really do care about them, that we love them, not because we are good people on our own, but because of the work that Christ has done in our lives. God, we ask that you bless this service, that you bless our week, and that you bring lots of people to come and share with us next Sunday. We ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
please stand with us while we worship the Lord this morning.
today from Romans 12. Since God has shown us great mercy, I beg you to offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him. And that's in, in every way, in every way. We, sh we share the gospel. We, we work as if for the Lord. We um, offer ourselves, our bodies, our lives, our jobs, our families um, as a living sacrifice to him. Um, and again, that includes sharing Christ and sharing his love. Um, and um, so I just, I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Won't you join us uh, as we finish our worship time with Son of Heaven?
you to participate in communion with us. Please make your way to a communion table and return to your seat and we will observe that together. It's, it's, it's Mickey's turn to watch me, so thank you. Good morning. This morning I'd like to read from John chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. When was the last time you were hungry? I mean really hungry. If you're a person that's got to have a hot dog, chips, and cake, or peach pie and ice cream every meal, you're not really hungry. My mom used to say hungry people are easy to cook for. And that's true. And if you complimented her after a meal, she would quietly say it helps if you're hungry. People that go through dumpsters for food, they're hungry. They don't care what the seasoning's like. They don't care if it's cold. They don't care if there's a bite taken out of the sandwich. They are truly hungry. I know people that won't drink water. They have to have soft drinks. I got news for you. They're not really thirsty. People that are spiritually hungry and thirsty are not easily offended. If a car cuts them off pulling into the parking lot, they don't really care. Or a horror of all horrors, somebody parks in their normal parking place. It doesn't bother them. They're glad to have a church that they can worship in. We as people oftentimes fill our lives with sports, drugs, TV, alcohol, sex, love of money, success, Yet we find ourselves empty because there is no spiritual value in these things. So this morning as we meet about this table and remember our Savior who died for us, that takes care of all our hunger and all of our thirst, I want to ask you, are you hungry and are you thirsty? Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you that you take care of our hunger and our thirst. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus who died for us. Thank you for all the hope that we have in him and help us in all that we do and all that we say, Father, that it would bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And he took the bread and symbolic of his broke body that was broken for us. and the juice is symbolic of his blood that was shed for us for the atonement of our sins.
So now we'll pray for our offering. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you bless us greatly. That we have so much to be thankful for. We're not deserving of the gifts that you give us, but you continue to bless us, and we just want to say thank you. Bless this offering that we have here at this church and its use here upon the influence of this community. Help us in all that we do, Father, that we do the best that we can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you get to see my pretty face again. Uh, before we dismiss kids, you can go ahead and come down, kids, that's fine. Um, we talked already this morning about this big back to school event that we've got going on. Um, what an awesome opportunity it is. We got, we got people in our own community dying for lack of a savior. Like we need to build relationships. This needs to be a priority. But events like that cost money. And so uh, we're gonna take up a special offering today. Um, I've got a few gentlemen who agreed um, to pass plates. I'm gonna hand these off to Roger. And we would just appreciate, you know, any, any kind of special love offering that you would be willing to give to help cover the cost of this. Um, we sent out 5,000 invitations, and we have 1,000, 500 hot dogs, 500 hamburgers. Like, we are expecting a big crowd. Uh, we are really excited about it. So just any, any blessing you can give us to help us cover the cost of that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, now, before we go, I want to pray for these beautiful little kiddos, and then we'll head upstairs. So if you'll just join me in a real quick moment of prayer. Father God, thank you for these little blessings. Uh, thank you that their parents saw fit to bring them to church, that they understand the value of learning in a group about all your love and your plan for their life. God, we ask that you bless them and bless our lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. You're excited to preach the word today, aren't you? <laughs> All right, I'll get through this quickly. Um, okay, time for prayer and praises. If you would turn in your bulletins. Um, some of the updates. Um, I think last week it was mentioned that on Sunday, September 11th, there was a golf outing. I just need to make a little bit of a clarification. Um, Sunday, September 11th, so that... Um, there's going to be a nine-hole golf scramble held at Dogwood Glen at three in the afternoon. And it's a four-person team scramble, and it's $14 per team. The, there's going to be a dinner that follows um, at the Morrisons. There will be an announcement at the, or a sign-up sign sheet at the announcement table. And then um, that is just, I think last week it was stated that that was for caring for kids. That is not. That is like our church fun, bring your friends, family, doesn't matter if you're a good golfer, come and have a good time. Um, and then um, you can either do a team or if you don't have a team to sign up with, you can sign up as an individual and then we'll pair you up with people. So that's the um, golf outing on Sunday, September 11th. The other golf outing, which is the Caring for Kids golf outing, um, is Saturday, September 17th, and that I do not believe is listed in your bulletin. And if you would please make a note of that, um, it is at Etna Acres Golf Course, and um, registration is at 8 a.m., uh, 9 a.m. is a shotgun start, and um, we are also as a church um, sponsoring holes, so if you would like to donate towards that, you can. If you as an individual or a business would like to sponsor a whole, you can also have that option too. If you have any other questions about that, see Misty Kern. That is a big fundraiser that we do for our Caring for Kids project that allows us to help provide gifts and meals for those kids at Christmas time. So just be aware of that. 
As we are working on remodeling the church, there are free fiction books at the bookshelves over here as you leave the sanctuary. And they're going to phase out the fiction section in our lending library to make room for a resource center. Uh, please feel free to look through the books today, as I believe once today's over, those books are going to be um, taken out, donated. So if you want to, on your way out of church, take a look at those, you can. And then another quick announcement, immediately following our service today, there is going to be an informational meeting in the sanctuary for anybody interested in hearing more about the new changes and the direction of the church. Everyone is welcome and encouraged to stay, and the meeting will be over at noon. Our prayer request, Trisha Krigoff, she still has her severe complications with COVID. Uh, former Pastor Jim Lloyd's daughter is who this would be. So just pray with her or pray for her as she's going through those um, struggles. And then Ken Kwiatkowski has stage four esophagus cancer and it's spread to his lymph nodes and liver. And he's going to be starting chemo soon. And that is Kim Jordan's dad. So let's go to prayer. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for this day that you have blessed us with. And um, we come to you today uh, bringing Trisha and Ken before you. And I just ask, Father God, um, their health situations are completely different, but there are situations that need your healing. There are situations that need your care, your guidance. And I just ask, Lord, that you would be with both of those individuals. Help them to see you working, um, not only in their lives to help Provide them maybe with some comfort and with some peace, but also see them working in their family members' lives. And I just ask, Father God, that you would be with everyone who is providing care for them and just give them the um, knowledge to know how to heal them, to help make them better, and to help ease any of the pain that they might have. I ask, Father God, that you would be with us as we're preparing to head back to the school year this year, be with our church as we're working on outreaching and just um, serving and loving our community. I ask, Father God, that you would be um, with both the golfing events, one that is done out of fellowship and just to rejoice and the friends that we have and who you are and what you've created and the other one that allows us to serve you a little more to reach out to those in need in our community and I just ask Lord that if that is something that you would want us to participate in that you would encourage people um, to sign up for that and then Father God I just ask um, that you would um, be with us uh, this coming Sunday um, just help us to show your love to people. Help us to show people who you are. And I just ask, Lord, that you would help us um, as we prepare to worship today. Be with Mickey as he brings a sermon. And just help us to have open ears and a soft heart to hear the words that you would want us to hear today. Help prepare us to go out into the world this week to share your love, your goodness, your kindness with people. And just help us, Lord, um, to just take a moment and to recognize who you are. We thank you for all you've done for us and given to us. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. Good morning. Oh, come on. Yeah, I, I, I was jumping the gun. I was ready to go. Um, so here we go. So I hope you guys are ready. Um, we have a very long sermon ahead of you. Um, we're going to be reading through the New Testament. Um, you know, if you have your Bibles, turn to Titus 3.14. Titus 3.14. We're going to read, and then we're going to talk just for a second and pray, and then uh, get into the sermon. So Titus 3.14. It says, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent need and not live unproductive lives. Um, we are going to be talking about doing God's work today. And what it looks like to do God's work as a church, as a congregation, as the kingdom in whole. So we're going to be getting into that. Um, before we get into all of that, uh, there is going to be a very important vote coming up here in Indiana. Uh, the, the legislators are about to vote on what we are going to do when it comes, what the state's going to do when it comes to abortion and abortion rights and things like that. As a church, I would like us to pray. I would really like us to pray today that, that God absolutely takes over this and, and his will is done um, and that, that we as, as a church, a congregation, and a community can step up because there's going to be a massive need that's ultimately going to come out of this. And this is where the church, we, we have an opportunity to step up and show God's love and do God's work. So when we go, in, uh, when we go to God in prayer, I ask that you uh, open up your heart and um, let's talk to Jesus. So. 
God, you are good. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity in this wonderful country uh, where we're able to come here and praise you every single week. God, thank you for the, for the opportunity that you've given us to hear your word today. And Father, I pray, Lord, that your word is heard clearly and loudly and touch our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you're doing in this community. Thank you for what you're doing with this congregation. And Father, I pray, Lord, that our eyes can completely focus on you in everything that we do. Father, take any distraction away from us today. Help us to focus on you and what you have in store for us. Father, I pray for, for all the people in authority, Lord, that are going to be voting on, on these new laws. I pray, Lord, that, that you touch their hearts, Lord, that you, that you help them to, to do the things that you want them to do, Father. And I pray that your will be done. And Father, I pray, Lord, that as a church, that as the kingdom and the church in whole, Lord, we can step up and love people who need to be loved. To be there for people who are in need. To be the people that you've called us to be. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to be talking about doing God's work. And it, it, this, I'm going to take you on a little rabbit trail. Okay, so you might be 25 minutes into this, because I told you it's going to be a long service. We might be 25 minutes in, and you'll, you'll, you'll be like, what is it? Where is this going? I promise it's going somewhere. Uh, I may not know where, but it's going to land somewhere, right? Um, when I was a kid, uh, I remember... Standing outside, I lived in Indianapolis, and I was just, if you guys are familiar with Indianapolis, Washington Street, I kind of lived close to Washington Street, and it's a, it's a major road, and me and my friend were standing out there, and, and a typical thing happened in our neighborhood. There were people yelling at each other and fighting, and of course, being young men, we decided that we were going to watch it because it's pretty cool to see everyone. This was the Jerry Springer era, right? Everybody watched it because we're like, well, our life's not that bad, right? And so we were watching these people just yell at each other, and we were like, this is crazy. They got in the car, and they're screaming at each other, and they're, they're going nuts. And then all of a sudden, I, I don't know exactly what was said. I don't remember, but I remember this lady yelling, well, I don't care about this either. And then she just slams on the gas and starts to take off, and something comes flying out of the window. And being the, the good kids that we were, we decided to go make sure that whatever fell out was still in good shape and and wanted to make sure it was okay so we run out and it just happened to be this little tiny like wallet that had some cash hanging out of it we were like huh well what do we do here so we thought about it and we grabbed it and ran as fast as we could away before they came back right and, and we don't even know we're just counting all we're thinking is this is fantastic we just made some money right and now I'm, i wasn't a believer please don't judge me um but we're running, and we, we're cutting through, and we're like, we got to get out of here so they don't see us. Now, just so you know, we weren't that bad. We left the wallet. We just grabbed the money. <laughs> um, and and we, we go, and we hide, and we start looking. We're counting it up, and it's like $27. And we're like, this is fantastic, $27 divided by two. We couldn't do the math. We were public school kids. So we just kind of gave it, gave it to each other, and we said, let's go to the store. So we went to the store, and we start buying candy, and we start buying chips and soda. And I brought it home right? And my parents are like, where'd all this come from? And I'm like, we came into some money, <laughs> right? We came in and they were like, well, well, what happened? And so me being the person I am, I was scared to death of my dad. So I just told him, I told him the whole situation. He goes, oh, so you think stealing someone's money is good, right? And I was like, no, dad, I'm going to be a minister one day and I'm going to be able to use this in a sermon. So I'm doing this for Jesus. <laughs> but, but I remember him being so upset with me, and he said, look, you have to now work. I'm going to make you work, because you don't just get to take people's stuff. And so I'm like, okay. So he said, you got to go mow our grass. So I go out and I mow the grass. And then we had a neighbor, and our neighbors were Mr. and Mrs. Jennings. They were fantastic. They were amazing people. They had lived in this house, I would say, 50 years at this point, and they were, they were getting to the age where they couldn't really mow their own grass. So he said, you're going to start mowing their grass every single week. And I was like, okay. And he goes, and you don't take a penny from them. And I was like, well, that's not fair. And he was like, no, I'm telling you, this is what you're going to do. So I went over there, and I'm mowing their grass. And every time Miss Jennings would come out, she'd try to hand me $5. And everything inside of me wanted to be like, thank you, <laughs> right? But I knew my dad would beat me. So I was like, I'm not going to do this. It wasn't worth that. So I would tell her, oh, no, no, it's okay. And I had this fake humility as a young, oh no, I want to do this for you. And then I'd leave him like, I could use that $5, right? Every single time. And it went on and went on. And this happened for a couple years. 
and, and I would do it, and there was always like this kind of frustration that I had to do something for someone, and I got nothing out of it. Super selfish, I know. I can say that now, but at the time, I was frustrated. Well, then I became a believer, and I started doing whatever I could to get into the Word so that I could understand certain things about Jesus and share them with my parents. I wanted them to know who Jesus was. I wanted, specifically at this time, my dad. I really wanted him to know. So I looked for anything I could do to find a verse that would prove him wrong so that I would be right, and I found a verse. I found a verse. It's set, or Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Right? But I didn't go all the way through 10. I would stop at 9. And I'm going to read it. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, as a 13-year-old, I read, not by works, so no one can boast. So I was ready to go home and be like, Dad, I don't have to work my way to heaven or work my way to be good anymore because it's not by works, it's by my faith. I had the whole thing going. And I thought, how can he come at me? What is this guy going to, yeah, he's six foot two, 300 pounds and can throw me through a wall. I get that. But I have the word of God on my side today. And my youth minister, in a very loving way, said, maybe we should talk about this before you go home. Because I told him what I was going to do. And he said, let's continue reading. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He goes, you can't read certain scripture and not read the rest. And I was like, yeah, but it's not by works. He goes, Mickey, read verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. And I was like, I don't even know what handiwork is. He goes, you were created. You are, you are the, perf the perfect thing that God created. And why did he create you? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. And so I was like, so what do I tell my dad? How do I tell him I don't need to mow grass anymore? And he was like, you don't tell him that. And he was like, because I want you to be able to come to church again. He was like, but I, 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 want, I want you to understand that you were created to do these things. And it's not about, I don't want to do it because I don't get something out of it. It's about loving someone else. Even if you don't want to do it, it's about loving someone else. And this whole thing is to show someone who Jesus is. And as much as I was shaking my head like, oh, I get it now, I was still frustrated. It's like, no, you know, I, I, I want to bill Miss Jennings a backlog, and she owes me about $358, right? <laughs> like, I wanted to do that, but everything started to change. I started to realize that it wasn't about that. I wanted things to change in my heart. I wanted to be able to go out and do these works. And, and what happened was, all of a sudden, my heart changed. And I remember going out to, to do it. It was a hot day, the day after, and I was happy. I was happy, and I'm mowing the grass. And I look over, and she had this little Garfield statue. And I loved Garfield. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this just because she loves Garfield. And I'm going through, and then she comes out, and she hands me this thing of lemonade. And I drank it. And I was like, that was the best lemonade in the world. Everything just seemed great. And then she was like, here, I just want to give this to you. I was like, no. And for the first time, I remember thinking, I don't want anything. I just want her to understand that she's loved. Mr. Jennings passed away shortly after that, and I continued to do this throughout high school. Even when I didn't live in that house, I would still go back because I just wanted to show her that she was loved. And she was a believer, and I remember she would come out and go, you're doing the work of Jesus. Thank you. And that's a, that's a big deal to someone who's 13 and 14 years old. Because I'm like, I'm mowing grass. Well, how is that the work of Jesus? But it was doing something because she couldn't do it. And it was just loving her. But I, I thought about this because this verse has been used over and over. Like, it's not by works. And it isn't by works. I want to make that very clear. There's nothing you can do to work your way to heaven. It's all by the grace of Jesus. But as we read through this, we're going to start reading what it says about works and what we're supposed to do as believers. Because I think we drop the ball a lot. I'm just being honest. I can tell you I've dropped the ball. I've seen plenty of people drop the ball. Not just us in this congregation. I'm talking about the church in whole, as a whole. So I think that we drop it. So I want to go through this. And James talks about a lot of this. But there's something in, in James that I really want to get into. A, a specific verse. But we're going to read through James 1, 19 through 27. We're going to start James 1, 19 through 27. It says... My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Being, or because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. This is a very easy verse to follow. All of us in here, I know, are great listeners. We never get angry. 
We're very slow to that, right? Because we know it doesn't produce the righteousness of God, right? When was the last, was anybody angry this morning? You are all liars. I, if you have kids in here, I know for a fact you were angry at some point. I yelled at my daughters today. I told them to stay in bed. I did. I, I was leaving. I was coming here to church, and Julie was on her way home. Caden's in his room, you know, making sure he's being a good babysitter. He was snoring. And I said, I said, girls, mom will be home very soon. Stay in your bed. She's going to be home in like five, ten minutes. I need you just to stay in your bed. Okay, dad. Okay. Turned the TV on, gave them tablets. Everything was good. I go down, open up the garage, get in the car, start it, and the door opens up. And they're both looking at me. Now, Maddie doesn't know how to get out of her crib yet. So that means Jocelyn grabbed Maddie out of the crib to come downstairs. So what do I do as a, a loving pastor, dad, who's going to church to share the word? I said, what are you doing? Get upstairs. And I'm, I shut the door, and I'm like, I can't believe this. They, were, they could have walked outside, and I'm walking upstairs, like, frustrated. And as I get to the steps, Jocelyn, I don't know if you've seen, she's five years old, but she's about six foot three. And she's, she flies up those stairs like it's nothing. Maddie, too, is our, our, what we like to call our average sized child. She, she's going up, and all I hear going around the corner is <sighs> from where she is booking it up the stairs, but her little legs just can't get up enough. So I'm like, yeah, fear, right? And so they get in, and I lay, put her in her bed, and I tell Jocelyn, Jocelyn, now you're grounded from your tablet, and I'm letting her know, and I look over, and Maddie's just giving me this look in her crib. She has her hands on it. She goes, no, Dad, not mean today. And I was like, I will spank you right now. I'm going to church. Like, I was so angry. That was my morning. Back to the sermon. Okay. Um, so, anyways, I'm sure they laid there like angels until Julie got home. Um, but it, it, we, we have this. He starts off, and he's talking about anger, and, and, and we need to make sure we're producing the righteousness that God desires. It says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humble or humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. See, this is, this is a big one. 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. What does this mean? James kind of breaks it down a little bit, starting in verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is deep. If we really get into this, he's saying, look, so many of us are, are reading and we're, we're learning the word, but we're just not living it out. You, I'm going to be honest. If you look at over the last couple decades in particular, you've seen the church lose its influence. Lose its influence in the community, in the state, everywhere. Why? A lot of it's because we read about things, but we don't follow through. We're not doing what God has called us to do. We're not doing the work. One of the things that I find very interesting is that right before he says all of this, he says that we need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. Well, how does all of this fit? What does this look like? How often is it that we're willing so quickly to tell somebody how wrong they are, what they're doing wrong, and, and just go at them, and yet we're not even willing to show them the love of God? We're not doing what God has called us. We're, are we looking after orphans and widows in their distress? Are we being caught up in the world? Are we, are we living a world? And, and you can look around, and, and I hate to say this, but there are so many churches that, that don't look like what the Bible says. You can walk into a church and you can have all these amazing things happening, but in the end, it's basically for our entertainment. And then what we do is we worry about what everybody else thinks instead of the Word of God, which last week we spoke truth. Truth is important. We have to speak truth because truth is what sets us free. 
So when we're speaking truth, but we have to be the church and we have to live it out, we have to work. And James doesn't just stop here. As a matter of fact, in James 2, just the next chapter, he continues on going what this looks like. James 2, 14 through 26 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I just want to stop right there. There is a lot to unpack here. I mean, he, he basically is saying, look, we, we want to say that, that you can have faith without deeds because it's my faith that saves me, right? But he says, the one who says that, that, I can, that I have faith, I don't need to show deeds, I'll show you my faith by my deeds. And then he says something that I think is absolutely phenomenal. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. How many people have you ever talked to have said, oh, I believe in Jesus, but when you look at their lives, you don't see it at all? There are plenty of people, if you ever watched any kind of music awards, right? I grew up listening to hip-hop. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Now I've become a believer and I listen to Christian hip-hop. But, but I remember watching all the awards ceremonies, I do. I remember watching them, and, and there would be people that, that were cussing up every other word, and they were saying all these things, and what was the first thing they would say? I want to thank God for this award. I want to thank God. And they wear, they wear crosses, they do all this stuff, and, and they'll talk about God, but nothing in their life shows it. Now, we can look at them, and we can point them out and say, yeah, I see that all the time. But what I started to do was look in, inside of me, I wanted to see inside of me, Mickey, are you showing Jesus at all times? When, 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 when you're, you can tell everybody and you can get up and preach your, your little heart out and you can tell them all how much you love Jesus every Sunday, but when you're not in this building, are you showing Jesus? Are you loving others? Are you treating others with respect and kindness? Are you, are you doing whatever it takes to show people who Jesus is? And I'll be honest, there are definitely days I'm not doing that. There are days I want to lock myself up in a room and not talk to anybody. There are days where I get so caught up in life and that's all I can focus on and I become very selfish and it's all about me while people are outside of my house, outside of this church that are literally dying. That if they passed away, they would not be in heaven and that, that is not okay. And so I started saying, well, what, what does this look like? What does it look like? Because I, I want it, I want it to, to change, and, and I want to be different. And I love how, how right after this, in verse 21, James continues, he says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And... And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So what does this look like? See, we can, we can read verses all day and we can say, well, well God, I, I, I want to do something, but how do I do it? Right? He, he says over and over that we are to be helping those who are in need. We are to be helping those who are in need. We are to be going out into the community, serving people and doing things. And one thing that I've, I've realized since coming here, coming to Warren and, and being a part of this community, is that a lot of times in the inner city, they had food banks, and we would say, we really need help, right? You need help in this food bank. And they'd be calling out and calling out and calling out. And they'd have one or two people volunteer. Every Wednesday, I see the food bank and I see volunteers all the time. People willing to serve. And I think that's beautiful. And a lot of you here at this, in this congregation do that. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. 
I see a lot of other things happening. I see what we're trying to do now, even next week, we're, we're throwing basically a big party. Why? Because we just want people to be loved. We want them to come in and get a relationship so they can understand who Jesus truly is because that's what all this is about. But there's stuff we can do on our own. There's stuff we can do when we're outside of this. We can love people when they don't deserve to be loved or we don't think they deserve to be loved. We can do all of these things. In Titus 3, I want to read this because we're going to read all of the chapter of Titus 3. It's only 719 verses. Um, I'm just kidding. It's very short. But I want to read Titus 3 because Titus, this, this is Paul writing to Titus and he's, he's talking to him. And I, I will get a little bit into the book after, after I talk, but... We'll start in verse 1. It says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. Paul is starting this this chapter off. He's a little bit into his letter. He says, I need you to remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. This is not an easy thing for me. If I'm being completely honest, has anybody ever got smart with you and you were peaceable and gentle afterwards? And you're just like, oh, it's okay. God still loves you. First thing I want to do is go, who do you think you are? Do you, you really want some of this? Right? Like, I don't care how old you, I don't care if you're four, you got a problem? But, but anyways, that happened the other day too. Um, I didn't threaten a four-year-old, she was five. Um, but but it, it's, it's crazy, be gentle towards everyone. Why is he saying this? Because when we do this, we're showing Jesus. When, when, when all of a sudden we're, we're doing these things that, that are contrary to what everybody else is doing, people want to know why are they acting this way? Why are, why are they being so gentle towards people? Why? I've never heard them say a negative thing about anyone. Do you know anybody who you can say that about? I know like two. One of them doesn't, isn't here anymore. But I do know one right now, and, and if he ever said anything negative about somebody, I'd be like, whoa, what's happening? He must be really mad. But most of us, we get angry and we want to say, but why, so we can't even say anything, we can't slander anybody, are you kidding me? But what if they're not doing what we know is right? Slander no one. Be considerate, always being gentle towards everyone. Go on, at one time we were, or we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in a malice and, in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, but when the kindness and love of God, of our, or the love of God of our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That is deep what is he saying look i don't we shouldn't be saying anything bad we should be listening we should be doing all of these things that are contrary why because we once too were like all these other people that we're mad at you were just like them you were you were you were living that same life you you were falling into the passions of sin you were falling into all these desires just like they are and just the reason you're saying oh they're no good see this is the issue church we have, we have done this them against us thing for too long. It's not them against us. It's not we're good, they're bad. Here's the truth. We're all bad and only God is good. The difference between us is we've repented and God has forgiven. And he can do the same thing to every single person that asked for that. So how do we live? We go and we show them a different type of life. Look, I, don't lo- I no longer live this way. Why? Because God is bigger than all of this. God is bigger than my frustration. God is bigger than my anger. God is bigger than all the, the things that are causing me to be mad because none of this matters in the end. What matters is I want to see this new person come to know Jesus and love Jesus. And if that means I have to love them even when I'm angry, I'm going to love them because how many times am I making God frustrated because I'm not listening to what he's telling me to do or I'm going completely against what he wants and yet he goes, but I love you. 
And guess what, Mickey? My son's blood, that's good enough for you. And that same blood that flows is good enough for that person you're angry with right now. Love them the way I love you. It's this beautiful thing. It says that he, he, he saved us through the washing of the rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What is the renewal by the Holy Spirit? It's a changing thing. It changes. We might still struggle. There might still be some sin that, that creeps up. And that, sometimes that doesn't go away. But guess what? The Holy Spirit changes our process in all of this. The way we think about it. The way, the way we react to things. And he's saying, yeah, the things that used to make you angry, let the Holy Spirit change that. Have a heart the way I have a heart for these people. Because this is truly life or death. This is eternal life or death. We have to do something. Then it goes on. Um, whom he poured out generously through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these, these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So I want you to understand that what Paul is saying, I want you to understand that what I'm telling you is trustworthy. It is absolutely trustworthy, and I want you to, to, to just take this in so that, so that you may be careful to devote yourself to doing what is good. Well, what is good? What is good? It, it's, it's helping those who are in need, loving those who the rest of the world doesn't love, standing up for the ones who can't stand up for themselves. Do we want to see people come to Jesus? Do we want to see people in heaven with us one day? That's what this is about. It's not about just coming to church and getting attendance taken. It's about bringing people along with us to eternal life. That's what this is all about. Then, he says... But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Wow. He, he's talking right to them, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. What was going on at the time was, well, I'm part of this genealogy, so I'm part of this, and this is what was happening amongst the Jews, and there was a lot of pride going up, and, and, and here they are talking about, don't worry about any of this. Focus on what I just said, because all of this is unprofitable, and he uses the word useless. It's useless. How often are we caught up in little things? In little things. And we're like, well, you believe this and I don't believe that and this is crazy. None of them are heaven and hell issues, but we're willing to fight each other. Churches do this. Denominations do this. We, we bicker and we quarrel over all kinds of little things. And, and in the end, none of them are heaven and hell issues. Actually, they're unprofitable and useless. And, and here, here's Paul saying, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. That's rough. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. See, why, why would Paul say this? Because most of us would be like, but we, we have to love, right? We have to love people. But Paul is worried about the church and the people at whole. He's saying, look, if there's one person coming in and they're causing issues, you go tell them, look, you've got to stop. You got to stop because this isn't profitable. This, this is just dividing the kingdom. This is dividing God's people. And then if they do it again, you go and say, look, I've warned you, you've got to stop. Like, this is no good. And then he actually says, if, if that's it, you got to get rid of them. You have nothing to do with them. It may seem harsh, but in the end, it's, it's looking at the whole picture, right? Paul's saying, we got we to focus on the mission here. We got to focus on what God wants. And God wants people to know that they are loved and he wants them to have a relationship with them because as much as we yell at people, as much as we push it on people, as much as we tell people that they're wrong or that, 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 that they need a relationship with God, we can tell people over and over and over, ultimately it's the Holy Spirit that changes them, not us. We can help plant a seed, but who makes it grow? God does. We can tell them that they are loved. We can do all that, but God ultimately makes it grow. And so we gotta pray that the Holy Spirit changes that stuff. You may be sure that such people are warped and simple. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis, and I, this is a tough one for me. I almost named my son this. Uh, Tychicus, that's actually how you say it. I know, and you guys don't know, so even if I said it wrong, it doesn't matter. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come uh, to me at Nicopolis. 
because I have decided uh, to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos, uh, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Here's verse 14. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for their urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends, your, or sends you greetings. Greet those uh, who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent need. He could have left, he could have left it right there. He could have stopped right there, and we would have got the point, right? We have, to, we, have to, we have to devote ourselves to doing what's good to provide for urgent needs. But then he says this, and not live unproductive lives. So if we're not living and doing these things, we're living unproductive lives. See, what is a productive life? It's showing people who Jesus is. It's showing them in their daily lives, in the way we live. It's, it's serving them. It's, it's going out into the community and saying, you're in need, I'm going to give to you. You have something that, that, that you, like your lights are out, we're going we're to turn them on for you. You're struggling, we're going we're gonna to be here by your side. We're going to love you. You know what? I know that we've had arguments and we've been struggling and we've butted heads a lot, but I want you to know I love you. As hard as it is, we have to go and love people. That's what the church is called to do. We're to go and reach people. Why? Because they need Jesus. And I want to put these stats up here one more time. The numbers are going to be off because I had original and I ended up rounding up and I forgot to round the total up, so that's why it looks weird. But unchurched people just near us here in Warren, there are about 890 unchurched people here in Warren. That's people who are not going to church on a regular basis. That's a lot of people for us to go and share the gospel with, to go and love, right? And I'm telling you, these 890 people, there are people who are struggling financially. There are people who are dealing with some, some rough things in their life. They're going through divorces. They're going through heartache. And we as a church can step up and help. And then we start going to the surrounding areas again in Bluffton. There are about 6,230 unchurched people. That's a lot of people, right? And that's not far from, from where we're at. In Huntington, there are 10,200 unchurched people. So if you go on, and these, like I said, the original number that I had, but I figured it wasn't precise because people are moving in, but this was the number I came up with, was 17,300 and around 25 people unchurched. Church, it's time for us to step up and do the work. It's time for us to step out of our comfort zones and start loving people who, we, who need to be loved. We need to be doing the work of God because I don't want God to be like, I gave you 17,000 people in front of your face and you guys just enjoyed being together on a Sunday and did nothing else. I'm glad you had community, and I wanted you guys to be together, but it's about a purpose. God wants every single person you see at the gas station, at the grocery store, walking along the street, your neighbor, your family. He wants them all to understand that he loves them, and he gave his son to die on a cross. And guess what? He's called us to share that with them. He, he's called us to, to make everyone else first. Put them first, because that's what God did for us. And we have an opportunity. That's the most beautiful thing about this. Is you, right now, every one of us, we're taking a breath. And guess what? That's a blessing from God. Every breath you get is another moment God has given you to love someone else. To show someone else his love. That's an amazing gift. And I don't want to waste one more breath thinking about myself and my own desires. Because I know that when I pass away... God's, Jesus' blood has absolutely poured over and has washed me from my sin. And when I stand in front of God, I'm going to hear those amazing words, well done, well done. But I don't want to feel like, well done, Mickey. But how many people did you leave behind because you were focused on you? How many people did I put in front of your face, man, that I just, you had an opportunity and you just didn't do it. I don't want to be afraid to have deep conversations. I don't want to be afraid of how I look when I tell somebody that Jesus loves them. I'm tired of feeling nervous about, I don't want to look like a weirdo. Are you kidding me? I don't care how I look anymore. I, I'm willing to look absolutely crazy as long as people understand that they are loved and that God loves them 
and that they have a Savior who died on a cross for them because that's what this world needs. Do you want to see change in the government? Don't say it too loud. I'm sure most of you in your head were like, yes, right? Do we want to see that though? If we want to, we got to reach the world. If you want to see change in your neighborhood, you got to reach your neighborhood. If you want to see change in your family, you got to reach your family. If you want to see your friends uh, change their lives and turn away, you got you to gotta love them and reach them. It's up to us to put people first. That's what it is. If you've given your life to Christ and, and you've repented and you, you've turned all of it over and you've, you've been baptized and you said, God, I'm all in, guess what? Heaven is yours. That's amazing. But there are people that don't have that. And we have the opportunity to, to help change that by going and planting the seed and saying, you are loved. And I get it, you don't feel loved. And I get it, you feel like, like you, you'll never be loved. But I'm telling you, there is a God who loves you more. And I'm going to show you that love. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I don't care what you say about me. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm going to love people. When, when people are name calling, so I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to get involved in gossip. I'm not going to get involved in any of this because I want Jesus to be shown in my life. Why? Because I want everyone who sees me to see Jesus, and that's it. When I pass, I don't care what anyone says about me. I don't. Well, I'll be dead, so it doesn't really matter. But when I pass, I, the reason I don't care, the only thing I want is somebody to go, man, he loved Jesus. If that's all that's said at my funeral, that I, I, I know that he loved Jesus. I feel like I did my job because I want people to know who Jesus is. Church, we have an opportunity. We have a very big opportunity in front of 17,000 people in our neighborhoods around us that don't know Jesus, and we have an opportunity to reach them and show them the love of Christ. Let's not drop the ball. Let's pray about it, and let's do what God's called us to do. Let's pray. God, you are good. And Father, it is so easy to get caught up in our everyday lives and doing what we're supposed to do. Even, even as, as ministers and as, as the church, Lord, we get caught up in, in all these other things. But God, help us to refocus and make it all about the people who need you. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation. Thank you, Father, for the, the amazing grace and love and mercy and forgiveness that you give us each and every day. But Father, help us to show that same grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness to everyone we encounter. Help them to see who you are through what you're doing in our lives. Father, I pray right now that there is an absolute revival here in Warren that you absolutely pour your Holy Spirit on each and every one of us and that people see you and their lives are changed. God, because you are good and you've given us a chance to have eternal life and you've given them a chance to have eternal life and that's what this is about. Help them to understand how much you love them. Give us the words and the wisdom, Lord, and the courage to go out and show your love. Help us to, to be willing to be selfless and give up the things that we're holding on to if it means someone else can have. God, change our hearts. Lord, you are good. Help us to get rid of all the things that takes our focus off of the mission and focus on you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to reach over 17,000 people. And God, I pray that you give us the wisdom, the courage to go out and do it. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person here. And Father, may we bless you in what we do the next couple days, Lord, and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand while we finish with a worship song this morning. <clears throat>
to the things of this world if I rise or fall if I stand at all I am leaning on your everlasting arms what a fellowship what a joy divine what a priceless gift God I'm yours and you are mine let my restless soul be still and know I am leaning on your everlasting arms from the morning sun and mercies new to the evening stars every promise is true as I walk this Have a wonderful week. Don't forget about our meeting here after church. Please join us.